is Chef Joel White Duck Ringette, and I'm originally from North Bay. My grandmother's from Nipissing First Nations, uh, but I'm Algonquin and Ojibwe, and then part French and English on my dad's side with some Mohawk, but most of my teachings are Anishinaabe teachings. My name is Crystal Terrace and I'm the external coordinator of the Concordia Food Coalition. I do the education and engagement. Our impact with like Bite Me as a whole and especially with this event is to teach students about food security, urban agriculture and sustainability and in particular when we uh, bring in different speakers, one of our primary objectives is to make sure that students and community members get access to an intersectional understanding of food politics. And we really like when we can do collaborations with Indigenous folks who are leading the way in their own communities in regards to food security. And I think it allows people to realize that we're actually on Indigenous territory right now. I now live in Toronto for the last 30 years. And for the last 12 years, I've been operating a business that's solely dedicated to First Nations traditional food. My parents uh, provided what would be considered traditional food, but no one told us that specifically. No. So if you fast forward my life into the urban city of over 8 million people in the GTA of Toronto, I can, couldn't access deer or moose or any of the game meat that I knew as a child. bring us all together here in this wonderful building that's a Concordia and bring in Joel all the way from Toronto to prepare the meal that we're going to have tonight. And we really wish that everyone travels safe tonight on their way home because we're going to have a really nice surprise when we leave and bless us everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Marlene Hale, and I'm from the Wet'suwet'en Nation, which is northern British Columbia. Uh, Joel and I, we are both chefs. We are both First Nation chefs. I love it when I see, always see students come in and, and uh, really listening to keynote speakers like this because it's uh, food is is keeping all of us alive, but knowing what food sustainability and really knowing what the indigenous part of it is. Something we all don't know, and it's also very important for the Indigenous kids programs in cities like this because they come from smaller communities. I want to talk a little bit about food sovereignty, of course, that's why we're here. But I think more importantly is that we're actually experiencing it and you're participating in it right now. Um, as this journey has been, that I've been on for the last 12 years, which is when I started uh, Nish Dish Catering in 2005 at the direction of my medicine teacher, Mark Thompson, who told me I had a gift and a responsibility to bring back Anishinaabe food to the people in the city. One of the very nice things about our childhood was that uh, my father was a hunter and a fisher, and my mother was a harvester. One of the things we do often is we puree strawberries and make a puree pure strawberry juice, and we serve that as a drink. Along with what you're drinking tonight, these are items that are all served at Nish Dish Marketeria in Toronto, which we just opened the first public location in Toronto on April 28th of this year. And when we did that, CBC came down to document it because over 800 people came to the grand opening. And our little restaurant can only fit 20 people in it. So there were hundreds of people piled up down the street, blocking traffic. And so part of this journey has been what is Anishinaabe food? Because we know through the history and um, the very difficult and challenging uh, history of Canada with its treatment of First Nations people that First Nations people were put onto reserves and then access to traditional ways of life such as hunting, trapping, fishing was outlawed. So it was all ceremony. So what you've participated in tonight is the spirit plate making. So I'll tell you a little bit about that so you know that this ceremony was illegal for many, many generations and now, now we have it. We're participating in it right now. People talk a lot about uh, um, 
the resurgence of knowledge or the reclamation of our identity. I feel like we've been doing it all along. The thing to really acknowledge and to be talking about here is when we talk about the truth and reconciliation, our elders have said, we can't have reconciliation until we have truth. So what is the truth about that? Well, the elders didn't stop teaching the youth. It's that we had a mass genocide that took place or genocidal practices that forbade people to practice ceremony, forbade people to speak their language and outlawed hunting, fishing, trapping, and then had our people go onto reservations. The, the farms that we access, the animals are roaming as freely as they can. They're eating the food that they would naturally eat, which is the white grass. And they have no hormones or antibiotics in them. So that's as close as I can get to providing the game that I need to provide for the diet that we need to have that is traditional food for Aboriginal people or Indigenous people. But how can we change those laws? Well, collectively, we'll have to start talking about that. How will that happen? That will happen in the district. And the whole community comes together and starts saying, well, we know why these laws are here to protect certain people from certain liabilities, but what more can we do that First Nations people can make a living off of selling their rightful harvesting of a moose? Why can't I serve moose? Well, moose can't be, they can't be farmed. So I can never sell moose. How is that fair? When I found my community, which is very difficult because there's no centralized um, Indigenous community in Toronto, everybody's spread all over, there's a lot of different agencies, but there's not a specific hub where we get to meet. So there's a Native Centre and there are many other social service agencies, but no particular district. So that's part of our political goal right now, Nish Dish is trying to help create the first Indigenous district in any city in the nation. So how the, the additional piece to that story is that I started to work at a place called Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto and we did a, a diversion program there where um, our people who were in conflict with the law, some of their charges could be diverted to a traditional circle at ALST. So um, as we know, Canada has a huge overrepresentation of our people inside custody, in many jails and in many penitentiaries across the country that the United Nations has been trying to get Canada to deal with that since the late 1980s. It's about how open our minds are to engaging with knowledge and how we can use knowledge for our own communities to make them stronger, it always comes back to that. So in this case, many of the things that I talk about are to do with understanding the plant's teaching. So did I know that? I didn't know that because that was taken many generations ago. So I had to go out actively and seek finding a traditional teacher, have traditional teachers before communities were already teaching each other. So there wasn't someone who said, I'm your traditional teacher and this is what I have to teach you. It's not how it worked in the past, but sometimes it's how it has to work now. And in our teachings, everything has a meaning. Stones have a spirit. Plants have a spirit. The stones were here first. The plants were here next. The animals came after. And one of the teachings I've had, which is hard for some people to understand, is that in the First Nations culture, animals made a covenant with Creator. They gave an act and an offering of themselves to human beings. So some people have difficulty with the act of eating an animal, and that's understandable. But in our culture, the animals created a covenant with Creator to sustain human beings. Because in fact, we can't sell game meat that is hunted. We have to, based on federal laws, and the FDA only sell game meat that is farmed. And we know that corn is, is one of our traditional flowers, but then if you when, you, when you hear my talk about the Three Sisters, you'll discover that all the corn that we've been accessing for many many, many years is GMO corn and we can't even digest it, so it's not really good for anyone unless we can access white corn. And now we have to find out where is white corn? Because what we need to do as First Nations people is find out 
what was our traditional bread? Because you bet we had it. It was it? We know we, we had corn flour, but we didn't just have corn flour. We had all kinds of flours here. We had arrowroot, we had chestnut, but then I tried studying chestnut and to find out how to turn it into flour. It is the most unbearable work you have to do. So I was just like, I don't think this is what we were making bread from. So I found this recipe book probably like, I don't know, nine years ago from the Lovesick Nation. And in it, I found a recipe that spoke about the cattail. So we all know what cattails are. So cattails are everywhere. Yeah, we serve uh, buffalo, we serve deer, we serve elk, which elk happens to be my favorite game meat of all. And uh, we serve all kinds of different fowl and all kinds of different fish. We definitely uh, serve um, salmon. We do salmon and we smoke it on planks, cedar planks. We do arctic char. So I'm actually uh, from Treaty 6, I'm in Anishinaabe, uh, more specifically Soto, because it, Anishinaabe is a term used for a lot of different nations. It includes the Jibwe, the Soto, um, and I believe some of the people from Ontario. But anyway, uh, it's something I'm just learning about. Um, I'm majoring in First People Studies here at Concordia, and it's, an, it's a new program, and I think the fact that the reason his company is actually blowing up is because for some reason, I feel like we just became a huge fad. People start wearing our headdresses and cultural appropriation is, you know, a really touchy subject. Uh, if I if I see, and I'm actually doing, making posters for Halloween, putting up around school, and why you shouldn't dress up as, yeah, because we still exist, we're still here, and those regalias costumes, if you want to call them, have a significant meaning. This guy, this guy is very hard to find, but I found it at my local First Nations, um, First Nations um, Native Center. It's called Savoring the Wild, a guide to wild teas and first medicines, and it's just loaded with incredible knowledge about all things that are grown here and what those plant medicines are and how they help us. So, great thing to get, figure out how to harvest them and one last thing, I think if I didn't mention it earlier, there's a small documentary called The Edible Indian. You can find it on Vimeo. Please look at it. It's just short. It's like 18 minutes long. But it talks about why we're doing the work we're doing, along with uh, Chef Ronnie Otterize, who's Cree from uh, northern Quebec, and he has a restaurant with his wife called Tea and Bannock in Toronto. And they do all a similar kind of food. And he talks about uh, how important it is uh, to have uh, access to hunting and fishing, and then there's my auntie who talks about spirit plates, which is a quite a fantastic little documentary by uh, the director uh, Cass Gardner. Thank you all, Chini Wetch, for having uh, having me here tonight, and I uh, appreciate being able to share uh, my journey with Nish Dish and some of the food sovereignty work that we've been doing for the last 12 years. Chini Wetch, thank you. It's part of uh, the goal to create these bridges between non-Indigenous and Indigenous communities. How can we do it? We can do it through food, but we have to find out what that food is first there. But seeing youth hang out in their own community space and getting to meet them and hear them, and then the particular youth that are in my group, I get to hear all their aspirations because the, the, the class that I'm teaching is actually a small business entrepreneurship. So I, I listen to these youth and it, uh, they inspire me. So I think that stuff is all exciting. As soon as we see what we can do together as a community, it's very, very exciting uh, coming together and talking about um, what we want and listening to youth's voices to find out what's important to them.